Hey, Nicole Shuffler here, your tech diva, and you are in for a treat. This is the second half of my interview with Jack Canfield, one of America's number one success coaches. And if you missed the first part, I suggest going back and listening to EP50 on ERO and the law of attraction to be reminded about the value of your mindset and changing your mindset. In this episode, we're gonna dig into goal setting, feedback, taking action, all the things that allow this to be real. Speaking of taking action, you might wanna take some action yourself and check out my goal setting workshop. If you like the topic today, you are guaranteed to get value from the goal setting workshop I have available at techdivasuccess.com slash courses, where I have a goal setting workshop with three day curriculum uh, set with a 12 page guide. So it's my pleasure to provide that to you. I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed making it. And speaking of goals, we are on a mission to create a collaborative book to spark the Tech Diva revolution, and we want you to be a part of it. So if you have a habit, you have something that you've found in your life that has led you to success, please share it with our Tech Divas. Reach out. We would love to get you the information, and I hope everyone enjoys this episode. It is a true blessing, and I am so grateful for everything Jack Canfield has done to put this work out there. I hope it guides you as much as it has guided me enjoy. All right. For the tech divas out there, I am here with Jack Canfield, my mentor and teacher, America's number one success coach. And him and I are both committed to helping you get 1% better every day. And besides taking 100% accountability for yourself and your responses, which we've talked about before, one of the big things that can make a difference is goal setting. So Jack, I want to talk deeper on the power of goal setting and how it can just open so many doors. Well, the research shows that only about 3% of Americans, and I'm, I imagine this is true pretty much anywhere in the developed world, Canada, Europe, et cetera, that only about 3% of people actually set measurable goals for themselves every year or set goals for themselves for their life. We also know that 3% of Americans own 90% of the, the resources. And so basically goal setters tend to be high achievers. And so, uh, you know, most of us did not grow up in homes where our parents set goals. Uh, those of us who did uh, perhaps performed better because our parents expected more of us. They kind of set goals for us quite often, and we watched them pursue their goals, and we were inspired. We learn more by what we see, you know, than what we hear from our parents, what we watch them do. And so if, if you were like most people, you didn't grow up in that kind of home. You know, you grew up in middle class, lower middle class, or lower home, and, and that wasn't happening. So it's really important to set goals. And a goal is something that's measurable in time and space. I always say the key factors are how much by when. In other words, if I say I want to increase my income, that's not a goal. If I say I want to double my income, that sounds more specific, but it's still not a goal because my subconscious mind doesn't know exactly how much and by when. But let's say if my goal, if my current income was 150000 a year and I said I want to double it, my goal would become I will earn $300,000 as my annual income by December 31st, 2021, that kind of thing. So it's how much by when. If you wanna lose weight, that's not a goal. If you say I will weigh 127 pounds by June 30th, 2022 at 5 p.m., that's a goal. So we always say it's measurable. If someone from the outside world could show up and look at something that would document that this was done. You're standing on your scale, you're showing them your IRS form or your, your savings account. They can measure the amount of square feet in your home. They can see if you actually have that car in your garage. Uh, you know, they can, uh, and a lot of times we say things like, I wanna have a better relationship with my husband. Well, how would we know? Well, and often people will say things like this, honey, I want you to be more helpful. Well, what the hell does that mean? You know, but if you say, honey, I want you four nights a week to help me with the dishes, and I want you to put the kids to bed three nights a week without me so I can relax. Well, that's measurable. So basically, you know, I remember this one couple said, I want to, we want to have more, a, a happier relationship with each other. And it turned out that their goal was that one night a week uh, from about seven till nine, they would go into the living room and they would both act no older than six years old and just have fun and play. And they did puzzles, they painted each other with watercolors, they, they did uh, 
tea parties. They played all kinds of games. And it was measurable. It was two hours of that kind of behavior. And so you have to be really clear what it means. I want more free time. Well, how much and by when? And what do you, how are you defining free time? I define it. A free day is midnight to midnight with no work-related activity. No emails, no texts, no reading for business, et cetera. And my goal is to have 100 of those a year, which is pretty much you know, the equivalent of every weekend. Although I work a lot of weekends, so I take them off in the middle of the week. So first of all, set goals. Goal setters are high achievers. And um, we did a survey of entrepreneurs. We were writing a book called uh, The Power of Focus and found we interviewed 2,000 entrepreneurs by survey and found that the ones who were super successful, they took 100% responsibility for their life. They were goal setters and they were action takers. In other words, they didn't sit around and, and just talk about stuff forever and plan, plan, plan. They took action and then they responded to the feedback from that action and they kept correcting until they got to where they wanted to go. So I would say, make sure that you're setting goals we often call them smart goals. They're specific, measurable, they're achievable, they're realistic, and they're time bound, which is the buy when part. And the value of this is now you have something to hold yourself accountable to. I recommend you review your goals at least once a week, have them on a sheet of paper. I have seven areas of my life I mentioned. I have three goals in each of those areas. That's a lot. I don't recommend that for someone starting out. Maybe one goal in each of those seven areas. And then read that every week. Close your eyes. Imagine you've already achieved it. Visualize it. Feel the feeling you'd feel. If you do that, what will happen is you'll start to have an amazing amount of success in your life. And you'd be surprised. I'll give you an example. We had a yoga teacher take our training, uh, the, one, the same one you took, Nicole, and she was making $50,000 a year. And she set a goal to uh, 10 times her income, which meant 500000 which was huge as a yoga teacher. And in the next year, she made over $500,000. She said, I turned my yearly salary into my monthly salary. But if she hadn't had that goal, her subconscious wouldn't have worked on solutions to it. And therefore, as a result of that, <clears throat> it came up with some solutions. She ended up doing a PBS special called Yoga for the Rest of Us, for those of us who can't put ourselves in those pretzel positions. And uh, it became a fundraiser for PBS. And she got a percentage of that. And she became very, very successful. You can still see her Peggy Cappy on PBS. Wow, beautiful. And I think many tech divas, we talk about goals, especially high achieving tech divas. They have goals. This framework is obviously really powerful. In fact, it was the place I started in creating my coursework from the training that I received from you is really creating templates for women in tech to be able to take these goals. Mm -hmm. Where I hit a wall, even with my own teams at work is the affirmations piece. Mm -hmm. They can usually grasp, I need to set a goal, how much by when, and, you know, write it down. I think practice makes perfect sure. on revisiting that, but the affirmations is always a little bit harder in practice. Sure. So can you share the power of affirmations and maybe how we can really like, why go there and how we can make it more sticky? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's just, just a discipline. You have to act as if it's an act of faith. You have to trust someone like me or you uh, who's used them and has had tremendous success I mean, the first time I did an affirmation was I'm so happy and grateful I'm making $100,000 a year. I was making $8,000 a year. And some part of me is going, you're, you're crazy, can't do it. But my mentor, W. Clement Stone, said, just do it. So I did it. And that year I made $92,000. Now, did I make 100? No. Was it a lot more than eight? Absolutely. And so I went, yeah, this works. So I set a goal to make a million dollars a year and I had an affirmation, which was God is my infinite supply and large sums of money come to me quickly under the grace of God for the highest good of all concern as I easily earn and invest a uh, million dollars a year. Uh, and the, you know, it took a couple years for that to come true, but then I made a million dollars. The next year I made 3 million. The next year I made 6 million. And it's all because of that. And so the reality is that when you're doing the affirmation, you're changing the beliefs inside of yourself that it is possible you're affirming to the universe that you believe it. We talked earlier about every thought you think is sending out a vibration. So you're sending out this, I call it, we all talk about the internet. I have a phrase called the inner net, which means that every thought you think is like a mass email, like a spam to everyone on the planet. And those people that are tuned in that don't have you in their spam filter, meaning they have a similar goal, they can either benefit 
if you benefit or they benefit in a way where they could collaborate with you or they could be a source for you or a client for you or whatever it might be, it gets through their spam filter and somehow they are attracted to you. They don't know why. You know, I'll tell you a very weird, strange story. This is strange as hell. There's a guy, he's an ex uh, army guy. He was about to commit suicide. He, uh, you know, he had the PTSD from Iraq and he literally had a gun in his mouth and he was just getting to that place where he could pull the trigger. And all of a sudden he just started hearing this letters over and over, E-R-O, 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 E-R-O. And it just freaked him out. And so he went on the internet on, on you know, Google and he typed in E-R-O. And one of the things that came up on the front of the search page was E plus R equals O, Jack Canfield. And so he goes to my website and he reads about E plus R equals O. He gets involved in our trainings and he obviously didn't commit suicide. And now he's a trainer. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, that's bizarro, but that's how it works. That's how powerful this is. Now, most things don't happen that strangely or that weirdly or that dramatically. But, you know, as I said, you end up finding yourself in line at Starbucks or you end up having a dream or you end up in a shower with a creative idea that you never would have had before. You know, I got the idea to, uh, you know, write a book. I got the idea to uh, start my own bookstore and then sell other people's books. And pretty soon I had a bookstore that was making $90,000 a year. You know, so the reality is that you don't know how it's gonna come about. But your affirmation and, and what, what I teach is you want to use this form. I am so happy and grateful that I am now. So I'm so happy and grateful that I'm now making $100,000 a year. I'm so happy and grateful that I'm now the manager of my division. I'm so happy and grateful that I'm now running my own podcast for Tech Divas. I'm so happy and grateful that I am now, um, you know, developing a, a, a course for inner city girls on how to code which I think is something very important that needs to happen in the world. So if you're looking for something to do that's a contribution, that would be extraordinary. Uh, so the idea is anything you want to manifest. I'm so happy and grateful that I'm now in a loving, supportive, nurturing relationship with uh, you know my soulmate. All of that sounds weird when you first do it. Like, why didn't we learn that in school? How come that's not part of when I went to Stanford University, they were teaching that? They actually do teach that at Stanford now in some courses. But the point is that you want to make sure you do it anyway. And again, I, I always say, live your life as a set of 30-day experiments, uh, 66 days to change a thought form, a thought pattern. So do it for 66 days to change a belief, change a behavior. We now know that from research on changing habits, habits of thinking, habits of action, and then just see what happens. You know, you try a diet for 30 days, you go to a gym for 30 days and try that out. So why not do this? I promise you, if you do it, you're going to start to see some shifts happen that'll be, uh, it'll reinforce what we're talking about. Absolutely. You know, I started about two years ago knowing I am going to be happy and successful as an author and write a book. I went to Barnes and Noble and bought how to write a book in 30 days. And then within 30 days, I was presented the opportunity to be in Pillars of Success. And I remember the night that I was trying to make the decision and, you know, decide if this was something for me. And um, I put on soul of success <laughs> and thought, okay, let me, you know, really think on this. And my husband went to Panera Bread and I said, yeah, give me my standard, you know, salad sandwich. I never order chicken soup. All right. No, no offense. I never order chicken soup from Panera. And he walks in the door and he's like, you know, they, they didn't have what you wanted, but I just got you this chicken soup. <laughs> and I was like, well, there's my sign. So I had affirmed that I was going to do this and then things just started happening. And then a year and a half later, I have three best selling books. Just one of the many stories to testify to what you're talking about. It's really what's, just mind blowing. What's, what's funny is last night I'm working on a talk I have to give for a group down in Florida in uh, September, I think it is. And uh, it's called uh, How to Recognize Science from the Universe. And it's exactly the kind of thing you just talked about that, you know, all of a sudden some something there'll be a song on the radio with a lyric that answers your question. Your husband comes home with chicken soup. Oh, that's that Jack Canfield guy, chicken soup for the soul. Never eat chicken soup. Someone must be talking to me. I'm supposed to work with that guy, you know. So literally, there are always signs if you pay attention to them. Most people don't pay attention. Uh, but the, that's, I love that fact. I'm going to use that in my talk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, thank you. Uh, because obviously this is 
just a catapult for me to live my best life. And I know that that's what you're about. Another huge concept that has changed my life is this idea of feedback is a gift. So I would love to hear your talk track on that. Well, feedback is is important. I mean, you, obviously, when you make programs, you get feedback. You, go, you get bugs in the program. It doesn't work. It crashes, whatever. And that's feedback that something needs to be fixed. And I think, you know, and it, it's easier to do that in the world of tech, I think, you know, uh, because it's just, it's neutral, it's no, it's numbers, it's code, et cetera. But the reality is in life, it's the same thing. You know, you're getting feedback all the time. And there's there's two kinds of feedback. There's actually two categories of two kinds of feedback. One is called positive feedback. We love positive feedback. You know, you did a good job, way to go. Here's a bonus. I love you, etc. And there's negative feedback. You know, I'm upset with you. you. You got fired. You didn't get the job you wanted because, you know, you didn't get promoted. You have a headache at the end of the day. You know, these, this is all negative feedback. And then we look at what we call internal and external. Internal feedback is how do you feel? If you're unhappy, if you're sad, if you're depressed, if you're sick, if you uh, don't like your job because you're, you know, you just you, you get up, you don't want to go, uh, you're sleeping too much, you're not getting enough sleep because you can't fall asleep. All that's internal feedback that something's wrong. If you're experiencing joy, if you're experiencing a lot of energy, if you can't wait to get out of bed in the morning, etc., then you've got internal positive feedback. And the same thing is true with external you know, there's external negative and external positive. And so the reality is we have to look at both of those. And basically, whenever you're getting negative feedback, it's, it's I call it your off course. Feedback, especially let's look at internal feedback. Uh, one of the things we teach is that joy is your feedback that you're on course. In other words, when you feel goosebumps, when you feel happy, when you get an idea and you just light up, you know, when you talk about something you want to do and you're just enthusiastic, like when I'm coaching people and they're talking to me about options, I don't listen to the content as much as I listen to their energy. If they say, well, yeah, I could take this job. I'd have to move to New York and then blah, blah, blah. it's a lot more money, but you know, and then I say, yeah, but if I stay here, I'll be with my kids and my grandmother and blah, blah, blah. And I get to go to the park in the summer and I'll have more free time. Their energy is telling me what they really want to do. And so you always want to be paying attention to that internal feedback, either on course toward the fulfillment of your purpose, which means you're experiencing joy, or you're on off course because you're not. And if you're not experiencing joy and happiness, and it doesn't mean you're ecstatic every time you're changing your baby's diaper, even though you love being a parent, but I'm talking about the general overall feel for what it is you're doing, then it's feedback. Outer world. You know, they're buying your product, they're not. People are inviting you to their party or they're not, you know. So the reality is if you're not getting a lot of positive feedback, then you have to ask yourself, A plus R equals O, what do I need to change? Because because the feedback is an outcome. And if you're not getting positive feedback, then the response to the events has to change. Now, I'll tell you a tool I learned. This is probably the most valuable business and personal life question I've ever learned. For, for creating more joy and happiness and fulfillment and success. And the question goes like this, and if you're watching this, write it down. On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the quality of, and then you fill in the blank, our relationship, this book I wrote, this course you're taking with me, this podcast that we're finishing in a few minutes, this, um, you know, me as a parent, me as an employee, me as your boss, me as your manager, this program that we've given you that you're using, you know, whatever it might be on a scale of one to 10. And anything less than a 10 gets a follow-up question called, what would it take to make it a 10? And most people never ask these questions because they're afraid of the answer. Like I ask my wife every Sunday night on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the quality of our relationship? I have three sons. I'll ask them, even though we're Zoom call distanced and all that, you know, on a Scale of one to 10, how would you rate the quality of me as your dad or our relationship the last you know quarter or whatever? And I get feedback about what could improve. Very, very important. Now, do I have to do what the, what the feedback says? No. But if I want my wife to be happy, if I want a great relationship, then obviously there's a lot I can do more than what I'm doing. You know, I've been told that, you know, 
I need to come in earlier from my work because I tend to work too much. And she wants me to go to bed with her at least four times a you know, week instead of working till midnight because she goes to bed around 10 30. Uh, you know, my job is to put my grandson to bed when he's here. She's wake him up. And I would be watching the NBA playoffs which are, you know, happening. And so, you know, she tells me, now I get a choice about what I do about it, but I can't get better if I don't have feedback. It's like going bowling, the ball goes under a big, uh, you know, blanket and I hear all these pins drop, but I don't know what happened. And so we have to find out what happened. We have to be courageous enough to ask for feedback. As one of my friends says, feedback is the, the breakfast of champions. It's also the fast track to success. Yes, as a trainer, I took that concept to my work. I work in pre-sales engineering. And I said, hey, we need to go to our customers and we need to ask, how would you rate our relationship at, you know, on a scale of one to 10? And the sales teams just pick that up because then we were able to ask, how can we make it a 10? And they were just starting to preach it among themselves, which is when you know it was really sticky. So I absolutely love that one. That's cool. We do have a feedback loop that can really be hard for women in tech, especially when we deal with imposter syndrome, and that is like negative self-talk, what mm -hmm. we tell ourselves. We've talked about this a little, but I would love to hear again your antidote on um, pacifying and moving past the negative feedback or negative self-talk. Well, we talk to ourselves all day long. Some people have added it up, so we think 50,000 thoughts a day. Some poor graduate student probably figured it out in some psychology <laughs> program. But the uh, reality is that we find that most of our self-talk, and it's worse among women than men, by the way, uh, is negative. And there's a lot of cultural conditioning that women get um, in terms of that, and also just from the media and, and so forth. So I think the antidote is something we talked about earlier, which is when you do find yourself talking negatively to yourself, say cancel, cancel, and then replace it with something positive. In other words, you want to turn your inner critic into an inner coach. And, um, you know, anytime you tell somebody, I hate you, you know, they feel offended and they want to defend themselves. So you never want to like be angry at your inner, inner, your inner critic. You don't want to put it down. Uh, most of the inner critic came from your parents' voices or your grandparents or church or somewhere. And they were trying to help you. You know, they thought if you studied hard and ate all your peas and so forth, you'd be great. But they, they taught you a lot of things that aren't necessarily true. You know, don't air your dirty laundry in public. Don't be vulnerable. Don't let people know about money. You know, whatever it might be, things that can limit us. You know, don't ask for don't don't be a, don't be a nudge. Don't bother people by asking. You know, don't be sexy. Don't have fun. Don't laugh. Don't make fun of people. You know, all the kind of stuff that takes a lot of authenticity and transparency out of life. So, what you want to do is just say thank you for your advice. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be listening to it. What I would like from you is coaching, not a criticism. And here's some things you could say to me and, and then say them to yourself, uh, say them to your inner critic, teach it how to talk to you. We talked about doing the mirror exercise. If you do the mirror exercise every night, I have one woman who's been doing it for seven years in a row, hasn't missed a day. Uh, she's very proud of it. That's how I know about it. We keep track of it. And um, she was a pretty uptight, bitchy New Yorker type person. And she's now one of the most loving people. They invite her to teach at yoga retreats and all this kind of stuff. And so uh, the antidote to negative self-talk is positive self-talk. Read literature that's uplifting, that's nurturing, that tells us how great we are. Listen to podcasts like the one you're listening to now. Watch uplifting TED Talks. And also constantly be saying nice things to yourself and acknowledge yourself uh for little things you did you know you might have made three mistakes today and had 21 successes you got dressed you got to work you ate a good meal you did some things you got some things accomplished you drove home without getting killed you know whatever and then we focus on the three things we did wrong so we're going to make mistakes all the time you know excuse yourself for that focus on the positive acknowledge yourself do that mirror exercise and uh, i think if you do that you'll see yourself your self-talk will change too positive. Absolutely, Jack. I have to second that. I'm not as good as uh, your friend there doing it every day for seven years, but I do try to do it very often. Well, this has been really insightful on goal setting. I want to hit a few last things before sure. we head out. One is the power of asking, asking mm -hmm. for the promotion, the raise, the opportunity, the visibility, obviously aligned to your goals and affirmations. So can you please share the power of just asking and some of the amazing things that you've witnessed? 
Well, I think Gandhi summed it up. You know, Mama Gandhi, the great Indian teacher, summed it up. He said, if you don't ASK, you don't GET. And so the idea is everything in universe that happens, it's called progress, occurs because, because someone asks for something, someone made an offer, someone made a request, or someone took an action. So basically, if I ask you for some advice, or if I ask you, will you pay me this money if I give you that, then I made a request, something happens. I can make an offer. I'll do this for you if you do that for me. You know, pay me, whatever. Uh, that makes things happen. Or if I take an action, I send you an email, I, 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 I write a book, etc. So asking is important. And most women have been trained not to ask. We have been, you know, I say we, but women have been the ones who've been asked. You know, you're the ones that take care of the children. You're supposed to do the housework, even though you worked all day. Uh, you know, you're taking care of your parents. Uh, you had to take care of your younger siblings when you were younger. And so you, you become codependent, you know, and, and asking was not what you were reinforced to do. And so a lot of times we're afraid of asking because we're afraid people will say no. We're fear of rejection. And here's the deal. If you ask for something and you get a no, it didn't get worse. You already had a no. In other words, if I ask uh, Nicole to have lunch with me tonight or today after this interview or dinner tonight, whatever, and she says, no, well, I didn't have anyone to eat dinner with before I asked her. I don't have anyone to eat dinner with after I asked her. It didn't get worse. If I asked my boss for a raise and my boss says, no, it didn't get worse. I didn't have a raise before. I don't have a raise now. And one of the most powerful questions you can ever learn is when they say no, you say, well, what would have to happen for you to say yes? What would have to happen for you to say yes? With Chicken Soup for the Soul, we got turned down by 144 publishers and said, people don't publish short stories. They don't read short stories. It's a stupid title. It's too nicey nice. You know, the stories are all positive, et cetera. So finally, someone taught me this question. I asked this publisher, I said, what would have to happen for you to say yes? And he said, well, I'd have to know I could sell 20,000 copies. So Mark Victor Hansen, my co-author and I, we went out and we had 20,000 people over the course of several months, because we were talking sometimes to 500 people every time we gave a talk, fill out a piece of paper that we put on their pieces uh, on their chair that said, I promise to buy X number of copies of Chicken Soup for the Soul. Some people said one, some people said five, one guy said a thousand, he actually did later, gave them to all his coaching clients. And when we had 20,000 promises to buy, we flew to Florida with two bankers boxes full of these and we said, here, we said, okay, I'll publish your book. So the reality is ask, 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 ask. There's something called the law of, of probabilities. The more people you ask, the more likely you'll get a yes. 144 no's turned into one yes that made me a multimillionaire. So the reality is ask, ask, ask. We often say we want you to become an ask hole. Just ask, ask, ask. Don't be afraid of rejection. And you can ask the same person over and over. You can go back again. Things have changed. A month later, maybe they can say yes. They got more money. They've lost their job. Whatever you're asking them for is now relevant when it wasn't before. So for 30 days, practice asking. Make at least one ask a day that you wouldn't have asked for normally. Just see what happens. You'd be surprised. It'll change your life. Well, I'm definitely glad I asked for this interview because <laughs> it has been a true joy. I cannot wrap a Jack Canfield interview without talking on one of the more critical aspects of making all of this real. And that we've hinted on is taking action. So let's touch on that before we head out. I, well, you know, it's funny. We talk about the law of attraction. The last six letters in the word attraction are A-C-T-I-O-N. So the law of attraction has a key in it, which is you have to do all this inner work we've talked about, but then you have to act. You're going to get inspirations to act. Sometimes they'll seem silly out of the blue, but they come with a vortex of energy in that moment. There's a book written, I think it's called the 10 second rule, that when you have an idea within 10 seconds, do something that puts it into action. Maybe it's just make a phone call, set up an appointment, uh, put something in your calendar where you're going to do something, you know, set up um, a, a lunch appointment with somebody, whatever it is, but do something to get into action. And action is what actually makes things happen. Obviously, we teach the rule of five. The rule of five says, once I know what my top goals are, I'm going to do five things a day to achieve that goal, that my breakthrough goal or my breakthrough goals, five actions a day. If you do that, that's like, I think, 1,825 actions a year toward the achievement of that goal. 
you know, if you wrote one page a day, you'd write 1,825 pages of a book. You'd have three books like you did. If you um, made 1,825 sales calls, you know, that's a lot of people that could possibly say yes to whatever it is you're selling. If you, um, you know, exercised for just five minutes a day, you know, at the end of the year, that's a lot of exercise. So the point I'm saying is, make a list of five actions you can take every day and then don't go to bed until you take them you know make sure you take them check them off and get into action and one of the ways to keep yourself in action is to have a an accountability partner so if nicole was my accountability partner we would call each other every day usually in the morning and just a five minute call nothing abusive and I'd say, Nicole, here's my five things I'm committed to today. What are yours? And tomorrow I would say, I did these five things or I did four, but I got stuck here. She'd say, are you willing to recommit to that? No excuses taken. No, no, no blaming, no complaining. Just are you willing to recommit? Yes, I'm going to put that on my thing today. Because if I know I have to call Nicole every day and tell her whether I did it or not, there's this kind of external pressure. Because a lot of you are working from home or you're working alone or you're an independent contractor. And the reality is you have no boss. And so we tend to put off the difficult things in favor of the easy things, but the, it's the difficult things that get us where we want to go that we, we, we avoid. So that's one way to keep yourself in action. And then you can give yourself little rewards, you know, uh, for taking those actions. You know, if you do all 25 actions this week, you're going to, you know, take yourself out and do something or, you know, give yourself a spa treatment or do your nails or spend a half hour in the, in the tub, you know, with your favorite bath bomb or whatever. Absolutely. I like a good uh, podcast myself. Well, this has been the whole enchilada. It's everything that I think we need to build a foundation of mindset, a success mindset, bringing in the law of attraction and setting our goals. So before we head out, do you have any final thoughts for our tech divas to help get them a little more successful? Well, I like, you know, just to end with a quote based on what we just talked about, the world doesn't pay you for what you know, it pays you for what you do. So a lot of us tend to be very smart if you're into tech and you're also very studious, but you know, I talk about this thing called shelf esteem, you have more, more books you've read on your shelf, but you're not doing anything. So we want you to have self-esteem, which comes from actually taking the actions, having the results and experiencing the success. Absolutely. Well, Jack, again, this is a dream come true for me. I'm holding it a little emotion because it's just so powerful what you're doing, leading this, uh, what was your, you have a goal again, and I don't want to get it wrong. It was it train a million trainers. I want to train 1 million trainers to teach this work by the year 2030. We're now up to about 4,500 and 117 countries. And as you know, we're now starting to train trainers of trainers. So up until now, everyone has been trained, has been trained by me and Patty and Kathleen as a team, but there's a limit to how many people we can do that with. So now we're training people in India, in the Middle East, to become trainers of trainers. So if anyone listening to this is interested in becoming a trainer, because the best way to learn anything is to teach it, just like you're doing, Nicole. So what happens is you can just go to my website, jackcanfield.com, or you can go to trainthetrainer.com uh, and find out more about our Train the Trainer program. There's an online training you can get certified. We also have a live training. And also you just sign up for the, 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 the um, emails we get sent out because there's all kinds of free programs we do throughout the year as well that you can participate in, lots of webinars and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I look forward to continuing on my journey with you and training more people and getting more educated uh, myself so that I can pass that on to women in technology because this is a multiplier effect and why I got involved with your message and your principles is because this can change the game for women in technology. It will allow us to level up, feel empowered and make a big impact in a male dominated field. We're gonna include all of these links in the blog on the website, including links to some of my favorite programs that you just mentioned. I know you do Breakthrough to Success and Train the Trainer and all of these things. Is there anything else special that you wanted to call out for our tech divas besides anything you mentioned? Well, if you go to jackcanfield.com forward slash transformation, you can download a 10 lesson free course. It'll come to your cell phone, your iPad, your computer, and wherever you put in there. And then it's um, there's about a three minute video on one of the principles that we teach. And then it gives you a homework assignment for the day of how to integrate that into your life. So by the end of the 10 days, some of these things we've been talking about, you're actually living. And I would just end with this, that there was a guy uh, who downloaded it one year, didn't do all 10, stopped at six, 
did it again, didn't do them all. And then he was in a hospital for about 12 days, did all 10 in a row. And as a result of that, made a million dollars extra that year. And he actually wrote a blog called How a Free 10-Day Course Made Me a Million Dollars Extra. <laughs> so it's, it's, worth, it's worth taking a minute to do that. Yes, absolutely. And just like we transform business with technology and transform our world with technology, we could transform ourselves with these principles. Absolutely. Jack, you know, thank you again for coming on the show, for inspiring me and everything you've done and um, inspiring our tech divas. It's just, again, <laughs> my true pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share what I know. Appreciate it.